I was watching a talk online this past week by a guy named Lee Coate who was describing a study that was published in Harvard Business Review this past month. It was about, a family, it was about family-owned businesses. I'm kind of interested in that because my dad, before his death in 2003, had started a family-owned business, which is he's still a part of, of our family and so on. But this, uh, this article in Harvard Business Review described how family-owned businesses rarely survive past the third generation. Most family-owned businesses start when somebody has an idea that they are really passionate about, they are on fire, they have this mission, they are motivated, they want to get it done, they really care, they are all in, they put in the hours, they make the investment. They may not have a lot of money, but that doesn't matter. They have a dream, and they are not about to be deterred. So the, the secret to their success is, is as much about their passion as it is about the product or the service that, that they want to offer to other people. Now here's the deal. If the second and the third generations don't share the same vision, passion, the sense of, of mission and, and motivation that brought that business into being in the first place, what happens is uh, this sort of sense of entitlement starts, starts to is kick in. And there's this maintenance mentality. Uh, people are just sort of placeholders. And when that happens, that leads to inevitable plateau and eventual decline and finally death. For the past six weeks in our series on the story, which uh, began with the book of Genesis, and in a couple of weeks are going to wrap it up as we turn our attention to the book of Revelation. But for the past six weeks in this series, in the story, we have been looking at Jesus, the person of Jesus, his uh, birth, his uh, miracles, his teaching, his life, his death, and most important of all, uh, his resurrection. It is hard to exaggerate the effect and the impact of Jesus' resurrection on his disciples, on that first generation of believers. The church's first generation was, because of the resurrection of Jesus, it was on a mission from God, literally. It was passionate. These folks were totally committed. They were all in. They were on fire. They would not shut up because they could not shut up about Jesus' resurrection. It had come as such a surprise, and it brought such good news to them that they had to talk about it. When the religious rulers of their day demanded they, they not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, Peter tells them, we can't help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In, in his very first sermon in, in Acts chapter 2, Peter, who he was a fisherman. He, he wasn't trained in, in rhetoric or um, you know, speaking or public speaking and so on. But in his first sermon in Acts 2, Peter announces God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Despite punishment and imprisonment and ultimately public execution. The disciples stood by that message of the resurrection of Jesus to the very end of their lives. Now the timing for today's message, as we've worked our way through the story, it just so happens that the timing for today's message is perfect because this weekend, while on a secular level here in our nation, we're celebrating this as Memorial Day weekend, uh, in terms of the church calendar, this is a red letter day in the life of the church. That's why I'm wearing this. <laughs> it's a red letter day in the life of the church. By the way, that, that phrase, a red letter day, comes from the fact that in the early days of the printing press, when people would make calendars and so on, most of the calendar was printed in black except for festival days in the church because the church was so central to everyone's life. So on days like Christmas that celebrated the birth of Jesus, Easter celebrating the resurrection of, of Jesus, those days were printed in red. Those were the red letter days and today is a red letter day in the life of the church. Today is the day of Pentecost, the festival of Pentecost when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
It's 50 days after Easter, and that's where we get the term Pentecost. Jesus had, had promised his disciples that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and they would receive power that would equip them to be his witnesses, and to be his witnesses starting first where they were and then in the, uh, the region just beyond that and then in a culturally different region just beyond that to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The dramatic um, arrival of the Holy Spirit and its impact on the disciples, those around them, is described in Acts chapter 2. And I encourage you to go home and read that this weekend. When the Holy Spirit, whom, by the way, the, the New Testament describes it very clear, the Holy Spirit is not just some power, but is a person, one of the, the persons of the Trinity. It is God at work in the world today. When the Holy Spirit descends on the disciples... Uh, the Holy Spirit comes with the sound of a mighty wind, uh, appears as tongues of, of flame resting on the disciples. I love this picture. Most of the, the pictures that we see of Pentecost, the arrival of the Holy Spirit, looks very ordered. You know, it's like the disciples, they have little golden halos, and this looks crazy, which kind of it was, you know, when it, it happened. It appears as a sound of a mighty wind, appears... Tongues of flame resting on the disciples, and then it equips them to speak with supernatural clarity and power about Jesus and uh, who he was and about his resurrection and what it means for the world today. It was incredible because uh, there were visitors from all over the world, the known world at that time, who were visiting Jerusalem to celebrate um, this special uh, e event, one of the festivals to, that all all Jewish men were expected to, to, um, to celebrate and mark in Jerusalem. There are people from all these nations, different cultures. They spoke different languages. When the Holy Spirit visited the disciples, they start talking about Jesus, and they start speaking in languages that they have never studied before. And other people hear it, and they understand what they're talking about. And they, they, there's no explanation for this. 3,000 people respond to Peter's sermon. First time ever he's been a public speaker. 3,000 people respond and become followers of Jesus that day. And with that, the church of Jesus Christ is born. Now, I want you to be aware of something as, as you think about all this. At this point in history, there is no New Testament. At this point in history, there are no church buildings. At this point in history, um, there's no church organization because really up to this point, there is no church. All we have here are just people like Peter who had been eyewitnesses the whole time of Jesus' public ministry and had been witnesses to his resurrection. All we have are people like Peter who are on fire and they're just telling the story. That's it. They've got a dream. They've got a mission. They're passionate. They are on fire and they're incredibly, incredibly effective. This is that passionate first generation, all in, on fire, highly motivated sense of mission that we were talking about earlier. Only this time, it's not about selling cupcakes or widgets or, you know, opening a catering service or whatever. It is about the most important thing in the world. The Messiah has arrived. God's, bless, uh, God's promise to bless all of the nations of the earth, that promise that he had made to Abraham was coming true, had come true in the person and work of Jesus. It's a church on fire. And here is the point. Guess what, folks? We are called in this time and this place to be a church on fire. Not a second generation maintenance church, not a third generation entitlement church we are called to be a church on fire. That second generation sense of entitlement, that third generation maintenance mentality does not cut it. The church is meant to be above all else a movement. And it is meant to be a movement made up of passionate, all in, on fire, spirit-filled, first generation followers of Jesus. 
And by the way, every generation can be a first generation follower of Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you truly are a follower of Jesus, you are a first generation follower. It's not something you can inherit like a family business. It is either yours or it is not yours. Now it's sad to say, but a lot of people who self-identify as followers of Jesus Christ take God's grace and take the life of faith and take the church and take scripture and take the mission to which we are called for granted. They don't see the church as a movement in which we have a crucial part to play. They see it as something that somebody else is supposed to do for them. Kyle uh, Eidelman has cataloged some of the, the common misconceptions that, that, that people have about the church today. And, and what is sad about this is these are common misconceptions people have of the church, who uh, n- not just of those who are outside the church, but people in the church have these misconceptions, and it's why the church is so ineffective. And I think all of these misconceptions are rooted in our having been taught probably uh, from hours of sitting in front of a TV set, and it's trained us to think this way, to see ourselves as consumers rather than spending time in Scripture where we are called to see ourselves as contributors who live our lives in response, joyful grateful response to what God has done for us in Christ. Uh, What are some of these common misconceptions? Well, you know, there's some people who treat church as if it were a movie theater where we go to be entertained. And and folks leave the church and they evaluate the entertainment value. Oh, that was a good message. I I don't know. Wow, the music was really great today. A, a, a movie theater where we go to, to, to be entertained. Here's a really real common one. Uh, many people treat the church as if it were a retail store or, a, you know, franchise where we shop around uh, for what meets our needs, what meets our family's needs at the least possible cost to us. I have people all the time show up, and it's, it's common. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that it's, it's not really what we, we find in Scripture. It's not what the church was meant to be, where people show up and say, well, I'm just shopping right now. A lot of people, third, see the church as a restaurant where we go to be waited on by people who live to serve us. If they don't serve us in the manner to which we feel we are entitled, we get upset. We see it as a, as a gas station that we drive to every so often when we need to get refilled or refueled or pumped up. All those views, they're, they're pretty common views, even, as I said, among people who self-identify as Christians. Let me tell you what they all have in common. Number one, there's not a, an, a bit of biblical support for any of those pictures of church. I'll tell you the other thing they all have in common. It's all about me. It's all about me. My needs. What are you going to give me? The New Testament teaches that the church began as a movement and that the church is meant to be today a movement that is made up of people who are all in, on fire, and passionate about the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. If we see the church as a movie theater or a restaurant or a gas station or whatever it is that it's all about me, I have a question for you. Ask yourself if every person in the church of Jesus Christ were just like me, like you, every person, uh, would it be more or less effective? If every person prayed like you pray, if every person gave like you gave, if every person was involved as you are involved, if every person were as loving as you are loving, if every person served as you serve, if, as, if every person had faith that could move mountains or not, the same faith that you have, would the church be better or worse?
when folks in the New Testament period became followers of Jesus Christ in that first generation, I'm not saying that things were perfect. They, they weren't. There were challenges and struggles as people, you know, lived out the implications. And, and for every one of us, we're a combination of people that are spirit-filled, on-fire followers, but also there's this other part of us that's still broken and need, in need of redemption. When people became followers of Jesus Christ in that first generation church, their lives changed dramatically. Luke tells us about it in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And one of the things I want you to notice as you, you hear these words, as you read them on the screen, there are no singular pronouns. It's not about me. It's all plural pro- pronouns. It's about us. Listen to what Luke writes. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Watch that. We'll look at that in a second. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. They devoted themselves to it. Everyone was, was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Do we see wonders and signs in the church today? And if not, why not? Is it because we're not a praying church? Is it because we don't have faith that could move mountains? Is it because we don't expect God to do anything? All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's a picture of that on-fire first generation. This portrait of first-generation Christ followers reminds us that uh, above all, you know what? When we become followers of Christ, we're called to community life. We are called to community life. I love the fact that the Scripture reading this morning was done in the context of a small group. It's one of the important values that we have here at Stonebridge group life. And there are five things, at least, that characterize uh, life in this first generation Christian community. First of all, we, we see that it's a learning church. It's a learning church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What's the apostles' teaching? You know what? These guys literally, when they came together as a community of faith, they could devote themselves to the apostles' teaching because the apostles were right there telling them about Jesus. And if there was a skeptic in the group, they could say, he couldn't possibly have been raised from the dead. Oh, yeah? I was there. I saw it. I'll lay my life on the line for this one, folks. I was there. While these believers were able to listen to Jesus' disciples firsthand, the apostles' teaching. By the way, the word, uh, there's the word disciple and apostle. The word disciple means a, a follower of someone, a student of someone. Apostle, uh, the 12 disciples became the 12 apostles when they were sent out. The, the word apostle means to send out. They share the word. While these believers were able to listen to, to Jesus' disciples firsthand, the apostles' teaching still comes to us. It's, it's just as accessible to us. It's amazing, but it's true. It comes to us in written form in the New Testament. The, the New Testament is essentially, the Gospels in particular, are the words that were recorded from the apostles' teaching so that subsequent generations could have access to their firsthand eyewitness accounts after their death. And some people say, well, yeah, but isn't the New Testament, isn't that a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, and it's all distorted and everything? People who say that have never studied the manuscript evidence uh, and the, the history of transmission. 
Because these gospels were written within years of Jesus' death and resurrection. The letters of the Apostle Paul within years of Jesus' death and resurrection. And over all of these years of subsequent transition from generation to generation, we find incredible consistency. They don't change. If, if there are any discrepancies among manuscripts, there are tiny things like punctuation marks or spelling, just the kind of stuff you would expect from handwritten documents. But such care was given so that we ourselves could have access to the first generation eyewitness accounts of the apostles themselves. So it was a learning church, and we're called to be a learning church. And it's one of the things I think we do super well here at Stonebridge in our growth group ministry. You know, as I think about this series on the story that we've been doing, you know, you can get a lot out of the story by coming here, hearing the message and all that kind of stuff. You get so much more, though, when you go to the hub and you pick up a copy of the book and you start reading along with us in advance so you know what to expect and you have questions and you get engaged. You'll get even more out of it, though, when you get into a growth group and you start talking about it, bringing the questions up, digging deep into it. We're a learning church. Praise God for that. Second, you know, you look at community life in, uh, back then, uh, the, the community life in this first generation, one of the things that's super clear is they were a loving church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And then it describes some of the fellowship, how they broke bread together, how they helped one another out when they had problems and so on. Acts 2 tells us that the people who first responded to the apostles' teaching became followers of Jesus. Uh, when, when they became followers of Jesus, they were from all over the world, as I mentioned earlier. They came from incredibly different cultures. They spoke different languages. They had their own customs. They dressed differently. You could tell where they were from just by, you know, the way they looked and the food they ate. But somehow, these people from all around the world became one body, the body of Christ. They became brothers and sisters. How does that happen? What was the source of their unity? Well, the source of their unity was this. We conclude every single worship service with this for a reason. The source of their unity was the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the unity of the Holy Spirit. And they lived that out in their lives together. We're called to live it out in our lives together as well. There are around five dozen commands in the New Testament. For those of you who are following along on you version, I, I cataloged a bunch of those that you can, can read them. But around five dozen commands in the New Testament, you cannot, you cannot follow these commands unless you are part of a, a church family unless you are engaged in community life. Because these are things like love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another, accept one another, submit to one another. That means be humble, you know, be teachable. A admonish one another. If you see somebody that, you know, that's going off the tracks, you love them enough to pull them aside and say, hey, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but um, whatever. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Offer hospitality to one another. One of the signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and, and in the church is this unity that exists among people that are so different because they really do care about one another. You know, in the early church, uh, it's recorded in, in Scripture, one of the ways people talked about them in, in their community, by the way, turn on your TV and listen to how people on TV talk about the church. And then read in the New Testament how people talked about the church in that first generation. You know what they would say then? They would say, look at how they love one another. Look at how they love other people. I think a lot more people in our culture could probably tell us what we are against than what we're for, and that is not right. One of the great things, I was so encouraged last week um, here because after the message on, um, on the resurrection, so on, I, I had two people after one of the worship services, they came up to me. They, they waited because I was talking to other people. Folks you know, always have questions or comments. They want to tell me about a prayer concern or whatever. And these people were just standing there for a really, really long time. Very different in age. 
Um, the first one came up to me and said, I really, I've was been waiting here for a while because I just really wanted you to know something. I said, what's that? And this person said, um, I have just started coming here and I really didn't expect what I found here. I said, what'd you find here? And she said, people are so kind. I went, wow, thank you for sharing that. Because, I, you know, I've been, been thinking about that. And as a church and our leadership and stuff, we've been really working. We've been actually trying to put systems in place to make it easier for people to be kind and to be reminded to be kind. And by the way, let me just remind you, be kind. <laughs> in class 101, I kind of do this joke where I say, you know, people will bring this up every so often. Say, well, people were so nice to me when I came on campus. And, and I said, yeah, and if you're not going to be nice to other people, don't join the church. There are lots of other ones out there. <laughs> but it's so important. You know, one of the things that it says in the New Testament about God is that his kindness leads to repentance. It's not when people, you know, point out one another's faults and judge other people and all this kind of stuff, which basically Christians are known for nowadays as being judgmental. That's not what changes human hearts. It's kindness. Where somebody, you know, shows up and expects to be judged and what they find instead is grace. That is the gospel, by the way. And by the way, the other person was standing in line. She said, uh, I just wanted to tell you, um, I'm not a Christian. I didn't grow up in the church. I've, this is only my third time here. I came at Christmas, and I came at Easter, and now I'm here. I have to tell you something. Every single time I've been here, I've just been amazed at how kind people have been to me. It is awesome. So one of the things that you can do is be kind. Um, you know, when you leave worship, just a heads up, one of the things that we're all tempted to do is we've got friends, and the longer you've been a Christian, the longer you've been a part of the church, all of your friends like, become church friends and stuff like that. And so we have people that just show up on campus. They're scared to death. I've had so many people tell me about how they sat in a car for 10 minutes because they were afraid to, to come on campus. It's hard. So if you see somebody you don't know, just go up and be kind. Introduce yourself. And you may discover that they've been coming here longer than you, and that's cool. That's all right. <laughs> I remember in my first church, I started uh, my job at my first church um, at, uh, in, um, I think it was in July. And so it took about nine months or so before my first Easter rolled around, and um, I was, was outside in, in front of the church, you know, kind of greeting people and everything. This one guy comes up, and, and he shakes my hand and says, Hi, I'm really glad to see you. I'm, I'm so-and-so, and I just wanted to welcome you to our church. Are you here for the first time? I'd been the pastor for nine months, and <laughs> it was Easter. It was the first time he'd been there the whole, the whole time. So, But that's great. I, you know, I kind of loved it. So it's a learning church. They devote themselves to the apostles' teacher, uh, teaching. It's a loving church, and that should characterize who we are. It was also a giving church. You know, in addition to the tithes and offerings that uh, these uh, first-generation believers would have given, uh, brought to the temple and so on, Luke describes also how they, this is amazing, they sold their property and possessions so that they could have money to go to Hawaii. Oh, no, that wasn't. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. By the way, I was talking to somebody within the past six weeks. Uh, he and some other folks uh, from our church got together, had this huge garage sale, the sole purpose of which was to um, support our, our missionaries from Stonebridge this summer. Isn't that cool? As followers of, of Christ, I... I think that we get the importance of giving. I hope, I hope you do. We don't talk a lot about giving. And actually, I want to criticize myself. I probably should do more. But I have this thing about folks, you know, coming to church, and I don't want them to say, oh, all you do is talk about giving. But you know what? We're really not guilty of that. We, we probably are in the other end of things. I should talk about it more. 
because Jesus sure does. But I think as followers of Christ, we get the importance of, of giving. All in, on fire followers of Jesus Christ, uh, on fire people, all in people, not nominal believers. On fire people lead the nation and lead the world in giving. And that's just documented. That is flat out the truth. I remember after um, Hurricane Katrina, about six months after Hurricane Katrina, I was reading a blog that was written, actually it was written by an atheist. Maybe it wasn't a blog. It could have been an article that was written for The Guardian, newspaper in, in the UK. I think that's what it was. Anyway, I was reading this thing, and it was this atheist was kind of saying, you know, I love my atheism, and I love to... Uh, you know, uh, not believe in God and everything, but I, it, it was like an, this, this article was um, this reluctant respect toward Christians. He said, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, I saw all kind of Christians just go. They would, you know, take off, off work. They would take vacation time, travel to New Orleans uh, to help people. Folks that lived in the area would open their homes up to help people. He said, I didn't see any atheists do that. And he was just saying, you know, we need to do more of this. Atheists, you know, let's go for it. <laughs> but there's really no reason to do that. I mean, uh, cool if, if they do, but, you know, if you think it's all about um, survival of the fittest, or I, I want to be fair. Um, but there's just something that's built into the DNA of followers of Jesus that, um, you know, Jesus says that he came not to be served but to serve and you know on the night of his arrest he's washing his disciples feet and he says I want this to be a model for you of what leadership looks like and what it means to be my follower serving other people you know everything that happens here everything that we do here at Stonebridge happens because of your giving it's not because somebody else you know we get funds from you know command central or whatever it you know just God's people responding in faith. And, and so I want to challenge you guys. I know there are a lot of people. It, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of, of the folks in our church provide 80% of the resources and stuff. If you guys aren't giving anything, if you're, it, it, just imagine if the whole church was like you, what it would be like. And then think about if the whole church was super generous, what we could do. You know, we don't have a money problem. We've got a vision problem. We've got a, a faith problem. I also want to ch challenge you, if you're not tithing, you know, to do that. God commands it. Jesus taught it. It shows that God is first in your life. It reminds me that everything that I have comes from God. It demonstrates gratitude. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. It blesses other people. It furthers the purpose of God. I want to tell you something. If you think we're too materialistic as a culture, uh, which I think almost everybody would agree, you want to free yourself from the grip of materialism, start tithing. Your life will change. Your priorities will be totally different. This is what Jesus means. It's what he's getting at when he says where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. You want to know what's important to you? Pull out, if you still use a checkbook, pull out your checkbook and look at it, and that will tell you what your values are. This is what matters to me more than God, or this is what matters to me more than anything else in the world. Bop, 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 bop. Look at your disposable in income. Figure it out. Do the math. Anyway, uh, it's a learning church, loving church, giving church, a worshiping uh, church. A worshiping church. That's what we're here for today. You know, devoted to the apostles' teaching, you know, paying attention like we're doing today, digging into God's word. They broke bread together, celebrated the Lord's Supper. They prayed together. We're praying church. They praised God. Um, by the way, wasn't the rap great today? And what's what going to be really crazy is at the next service, we got that and we got the bell choir. Now, that's kind of stretching, you know, the worship experience, you know, stylistically about as far as you can. Unity in Christ, though, right? And fifth, it was a growing church. It was a growing church. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
why did God add to their number daily those who are being saved? How was, how was that happening? I'll tell you how and why it was happening, because they were on fire. They were first generation. The resurrection mattered. They were learning. They were growing. They were loving. They were giving. You know, where their treasure was, their heart was. The Lord added to their number every day. You know, when we are all in on fire followers of Christ, when they, we come together, people are learning what the Bible says, what it means, and then they are actually doing what it says and means, when they are kind and reaching out to other people, when they are sharing their resources to help those in need by being faithful in their giving, when they're worshiping God sincerely and authentically. And by the way, that's one of the things. We just want our worship here at Stonebridge to be just authentic, real. It's not going to be a slick production. Um, my socks don't match my, my shirt particularly well today, but it's not going to be slick, but it, it's going to be real. When all of that stuff happens, when we are being the church, when we're on fire, the Lord will add to our number because we're going to be excited and we're going to start saying to people, oh, you, you need to know about Jesus or how, however you want to say it, you know, that could... Putting it that way could be off-putting to a person you might know, but it could be just the right thing for somebody else you might know. The growth of the first generation church now, I, I told you I don't want to be naive. It wasn't without its challenges. The very first Christians, here, here's a huge challenge. We know this because we've studied the story up to this point. Uh, the very first Christians are all Jewish, right? Every single one of them. All of the authors, when the New Testament's finally written, every single one of the authors of the New Testament is Jewish, except for one, Luke. All the authors of the Old Testament are Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. If God is going to keep his promise to Abraham, remember back in, in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 22, that you will be the father of a great nation through whom all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. You've got this, this group of Jewish people that are on a mission that, that God is going to use to bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham's descendants. What's that going to look like? How do you plan for a potluck? When you've got Jewish believers and then your new Gentile believers show up with pulled pork. <laughs> What's going to happen when Gentiles hear about Jesus and want to be followers? Do they have to become Jewish? They have to become partially Jewish? What's going to happen? Here's the thing. What it meant for the early, early church, what it means for, for us is the early church would have to think outside the tribe if it's going to reach all the nations of the earth. And guess what, folks? We have to think outside the tribe, the Christian tribe, if we're going to reach the world. We have to start thinking about other people who aren't followers of Jesus and how they think and what they need. Jesus had said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Okay, that's easy. That's local. That's just here in town. And in all Judea, mm, got to reach out a little bit. In Samaria, Samaritans and the Jews don't get along. So, oh gosh, this is a huge cross-cultural thing and I'm kind of scared of them and they're weird and they're wrong and to the ends of the earth. To reach the whole world, Christianity was going to have to become more than a branch of Judaism. And you know what? For us to reach the world today, the Christian faith has to be more than just you know, a certain style of music or the way we like it because we're most comfortable with it or whatever. God had promised through the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all people and guess what? All people means all people. That included Gentiles. But the transition to a faith in which everybody was welcomed would not be an easy one. It would take vision. It would take theological genius. It would take spirit-led leadership to make that happen. As we're going to see next week, 
as we learn about this guy who was a huge persecutor of the church who became one of the church's greatest advocates in all of human history, the Apostle Paul, to be continued.